Hi, my name is Günter Noack. I'm from Google Switzerland, and I'm going to present today on Landlock. Um, so, uh, first about me. Uh, wait a second. Does this work? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm interested in computer security for a bit more than 20 years now. Uh, I have been playing around with this for for a while. I uh, work at Google in Zurich, and I'm a Landlock contributor since 2022. And I'm also the maintainer of the Go Landlock library. And in my free time, I like to run and swim. So the outline of the talk is going to be: I'm going to talk briefly about. Uh, the motivation for why we're doing this. I, I, I want to show you that sandboxing should be fun and also that it's going to be, should be ideally maybe also be done by software developers rather than just by Linux distributors and system administrators as we've seen in other talks today. Um, I'm going to give a technical overview for, so, for those of you who haven't, uh, aren't familiar with it yet. I'm going to talk briefly about the IOCTL support that we added to Landlock in the, over the course of the past year. And uh, we'll then also talk a little bit about the delta of what happened since the last time that a similar talk has been given at LSS and about the upcoming features that are planned for the future of Landlock in, uh, in the next months. So, um, so first of all, about the motivation. As I said, I've been interested in, in sandboxing for, for a longer time. And um, around the time when I was started to get interested in computer security, um, buffer overflows were a big thing, and as a, many of you are familiar with it, um, an attacker can completely gain access over a, um, an attack process and gain complete control over it. And then the compartmentalization of uh, the normal Unix security model is things are comp compartmentalized between users, but not so much within the realms of what a user owns, so not the files of a user and not the different processes of a user, those are harder to separate. And so what often happens is when an attacker gains a control over a process, uh, the attacker is also automatically going to have access to a bunch of other resources that are uh, owned by the same user that is executing that process, like SSH keys, love letters, bank documents, you name it, uh, company secrets. And at the same time, <laughs> especially under the more traditional Unix tools with the small tools for a very specific task, tools tend to not actually need that many permissions and the, the set of files that a tool actually requires is a lot smaller than that in many cases. And so what Landlock wants to do is to restrict the ambient access and to only permit access to those resources that are actually required. And in Landlock, that is not only files, it also extends to other types of resources. In this example here, I'm showing files, but it's going to grow a little bit bigger, of course. And of course, that is the principle of least privilege that many people who know security have heard about. And um, so I played with this for a long time, and one of the first things that I attempted was uh, to use second BPF. And second BPF is uh, this unprivileged mechanism where you can load a BPF filter into your um, into your kernel, and the kernel is going to enforce that for the for the current process and for the child processes of that process, and it's going to run like a packet filter, and, but filter the system calls that a kernel uh, that, that the user space process does. And unfortunately, it has some drawbacks to it, and specifically, the, the drawbacks are. You can't follow pointer arguments like uh, file paths into an open source call, for, for instance, um, because that filter doesn't have access to the user space memory. But also, the, at the more higher level, there is a, another problem with when you um, create a policy with SecComp and then you deploy your program and then you leave it there. And then maybe over time, some new kernel version gets rolled out, that kernel starts supporting system calls that you didn't know about at the time of writing that policy. And the same goes for the shared libraries that your, your program uses. This can also be the glibc. So um, what happens in practice is that your program that used to do, say, the open system call actually starts doing slightly different system calls over time. It starts using open at, and then it starts using open at too. And if at the time of writing the policy for your program, you didn't know about these, you get to, you're basically faced with the decision, there is a system call 
that whose number you are not familiar with. Do you want to permit this? Do you want to deny this? And either way you choose it, it's going to be the wrong decision because if you allow it, your program is going to have more privileges than it is supposed to have. And if you're going to deny it, you're going to break the, the compatibility that the kernel normally provides, right? The one that says any program should be executing in the future as well. So that is, is difficult. There are ways around that. There are very advanced mechanisms in SECOM where you can still do it somehow. One of them is, for example, that you statically link everything. You always make absolutely sure that you know exactly what you're doing, but in the big scale of things, it's not very practical for many programs. And uh, so this is not, not so easy. Other mechanisms include SE Linux App Armor. We've seen a presentation on App Armor just before this one. This is mandatory access control, so it's not done by the by the process, solves a slightly different task. And if you, are, if you put yourself in the shoes of a developer who writes an application that is maybe risky in nature or processes inputs from very dangerous sources, then um, maybe you want to also as a developer enforce a policy. And for that one, these ones do not lend themselves quite as well, uh, especially because it's not deployed that widely. And you are starting to rely as an application developer more on the setup that the surrounding system provides to, for you. So you need to understand a little bit where you're executing and that is hard for uh, software developers. Now, um, there's also user namespaces that I unfortunately missed to put on the slide. Uh, there was a great talk about that uh, just before though. And uh, I recommend to, to see that if you are watching this on uh, in the recording. Um, and user namespaces also have, have uh, their problems uh, that, that make them difficult to use and they tend to expose more kernel APIs and actually be, they are used in a bunch of uh, security vulnerabilities as well. So, okay, so now Landlock though is uh, a new mechanism, relatively new was introduced in Linux 5.13. It's an unprivileged sandboxing mechanism. That means it works like SecComp. Uh, it's the process itself that enforces this um, that in, and that designs the policy that is to be, to be enforced. Uh, it is now the software developers and the processes that define what their security policies are. So it's more bottom-up. And uh, we also support the backwards compatibility story better. Um, so that you can actually know that in the future your program is also going to work. Um, and, and finally, also, which is also a little bit different to SecCom, the abstraction boundaries at which you, like the, the level of abstraction at which you define what the policies are, makes, is a, makes a little bit more sense than in SecCom, where in SecCom everything is based on the system call numbers and arguments and you need to keep track of what they are and how they change across kernel versions. And here you get a more stable interface than that. So, um, so the vision is essentially, we want to make Landlock simple for, for software developers to use. And this can be used to build sandboxing tools, but it's by far not the only use case. And actually we would wish that, that also many normal application and software developers start using this. Uh, and it is lightweight to use so, so that um, people can uh, can use it in very simple utilities. Here are some examples. Um, the ones that are in green are ones where actually Landlock was implemented. You can see, uh, so pipeline tools that would be used in a normal Unix pipeline are classic examples where it's easy to use. They have a well-defined input, well-defined output. They do a bit of, bit of processing in the middle. So um, for, for these tools, it's, uh, it is often easy to apply. XZDEC is one of them. That's, this is the, um, from the XZ project the decompression tool, where uh, I will have a slide on this one later as well, um, but also things like convert that does conversion between media formats um, also tends to be a use case where um, a lot of attack surface exists in the um, in the media processing libraries, and then also you know netcat ping those are all things that could be used for that. And then Sathura, the document viewer, is unfortunately not the one that I'm using right now, but um, that one also supports Landlock in a um, future version. So um, I'm going to come to the technical overview now. 
Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you have used Landlock in the past? Okay, that's a few already. <laughs> About 10 people, I would say. So um, the basic architecture of how you would design your uh, program that uses Landlock is this. You, you see, the in the initialization phase of a program, this is roughly the phase where you would uh, parse your, your, um, your command line flags and where you would parse your config files and where you would interpret what the program is even supposed to do. Um, that's the, the phase where you're probably processing input that comes from more trusted sources, right? The people who provide the configuration files, the people who provide the, the flags, they already invoke your program. So by definition, they have at least the same amount of, of rights as you have. So um, that would be considered a more trusted source of input. But later on, maybe you have some more nefarious attacker um, who starts to provide input from the side, uh, a media file, or maybe they can do HTTP requests over the network. And um, so you need to analyze a little bit what is the inputs that you trust, what are the ones that you don't trust. And by and large, in the initialization phase, you have inputs that you trust more. So that's the phase where you would want to figure out what the policy should be looking like and where you work in a more uh, open unconstrained environment and after you figure out what the policy should be you enforce you design a policy you, you construct a policy you enforce that policy and then after that policy is enforced the kernel is going to um, enforce the policy for whatever that um, guy with the hat is providing to you as input now um, for creating and 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 dropping the policy the the api that you would use looks like this there are three system calls to it. Um, one is called uh, landlock create rule set. Rule set is just the name, the landlock name for what the policy, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the policy essentially. And when you call landlock create rule set, you will get back a file descriptor that represents your policy at construction time. Um, then you can add exceptions to the policy. So the policy says what, what, is, um, what is restricted and then you add exceptions to that. And then finally, there is a step where you enforce the rule set. Now, um, to create the rule set, um, the system call is this one down here, landlock create rule set. And there at the top, you can see I'm passing a, a struct and it gets uh, two fields. One is, one is the access rights for the file system. One is the access rights for the network. And those are both bit masks of um, different operations, which I will show in a, in a slide, a few, few slides in the future. And um, that would construct a, a rule set where, where the operations that are set in these bit masks uh, are not permitted anymore under that policy. And then maybe you have some files though where you do want to see them and where you do want to use them uh, and so in many cases you would for example want to see your shared libraries that you load from user or from user lib and so the way to do that is after creating your rule set you would open a, a file descriptor to the surrounding directory or to the specific file that you want and then you add a rule with this landlock add rule syscall and then again you pass a struct where you, where you say what the file descriptor is and then you say which specific access rights you want to permit on this file. And uh, then this, this is added to that, to that policy. And then finally in the third step, this is the simplest of them, you just take that rule set and you enforce it. And up after this system call returns, everything that your process does will be um, run by this policy and, and double checked. And also policies can be nested. So if you enforce a policy and then you or your child process enforces yet another policy, it'll always restrict more and more and more and it only narrows down what you can do. Now, uh, the operations that are restrictable in Landlock, there are two main categories at the moment. One is the file system operations and one is TCP networking. For the file system operations, uh, this is, uh, I apologize for the slide, it's, it's very, very long uh, identifier names here, um, but by and large we have three groups. The common operations on, on the top are um, for 
uh, th those are the operations that let you open a file for reading, open a file for writing. Um, truncation is also one that, that we control explicitly here and also for executing and also for reading directories. So those are very, very common ones that you would uh, want to mention in, in, many of these, in, uh, in many of these policies. Then there is a whole group of them for directory entry manipulation about adding various types of, of uh, Unix files. And then finally, there is the one about IOCTL, which is a little bit special. Um, and this is the one that I will talk about a bit later. For networking, we have uh, these operations here on the right hand side. You see a very textbook example of the steps that you would undergo in order to establish a TCP connection. And uh, we have two access rights that you can res restrict there. One is for the bind operation and one is for the connect operation. You can see that if you want to walk this state transition from the top to the bottom on the client or on the server side. In both of these cases, you have something in the way that you can restrict. So um, it, when you use this, when you follow this schema to um, establish a client and a server connection, you can't do it if this is restricted. But there are some caveats to that, which I will get back to later when I talk about the, um, uh, about the future networking capabilities that we're looking into. So, um, yeah, and then finally, uh, the Landlock also has a, a backwards compatibility story, as I mentioned. Uh, there is a, a concept of ABI versions, so you can query what is the current ABI version that the kernel that I'm running under is, is supporting, and then it gives you back a number, and then you can have a, a lookup table on the side that, where, you, where you can look up which of these access rights already exists under which of these um, ABI versions so that you know which of them you can use under the kernel that you're running under. And this can be used to build a best effort mode as well, which means that you can write programs that will run on any kernel and then use the best, pol the most restrictive landlock policy that they can under the given kernel that they're running under. Um, there are some smaller limitations. So first of all, landlock is getting built incrementally. Um, this means that uh, many important operations are already restrictable. For example, you can uh, restrict access to the file contents on your file system, but there are some smaller operations that are still missing. Um, in, in the file system case, that is um, stat, so you can not restrict at the moment whether, a, whether uh, the sandbox process can see the um, existence of file names in the file system. And um, then there is a few things that are out of necessity also restricted. So if a landlock process would start to manipulate file system topology, this, you can see how this could potentially break the, the rules <laughs> that you have added previously in your policies. So this is not permitted uh, under in a, in a landlock process to do that. So you can't do a mount. Um, you have to enable the no new, new privs flag on your process. That means that you can't use a suet binary and uh, also the use of ptrace is restricted. Yeah. So uh, now I'm, I'm going to get to the part about IOCTL. Um, so IOCTL, as a, as a small reminder, um, is a system call that is a bit of a... Um, additional mechanism if Unix read and write are not enough for you as, a, as an implementer of a device driver. And uh, the interface is this, so you, get, you have to pass a file descriptor, you have to pass a number, which is the operation that you want to call, and then you can pass an additional argument as a pointer into user space. And it's basically a command multiplexer. It can dispatch to all kinds of implementations in kernel space, and they're mostly implemented by device drivers. An example uh, would be the one here at the bottom, uh, TOC G win size. Um, that one gives you the, the window size of the current terminal. So if you run that on SD out, um, it, it'll tell you how many characters in the X and Y axis you have for your terminal. And that's also where this traditionally comes from. So uh, this in my understanding, was introduced for TTYs actually at some point. So um, the motivation for supporting IOCTL and LearnLog is we try to apply the principle of least privilege here. And if, if, the, 
number of potential implementations that you can reach with the system call is so large that it becomes difficult to even, even for, for us as kernel developers to reason about what you can potentially reach with this, then this is maybe not something that, that puts you in a position where you can confidently say, this is what my program can do, right? So um, there is some desire to, to restrict that, also to restrict the attack surface. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's the motivation here. Um, so when we looked at the implementation of IOCTL, we found this. There is um, the system call is implemented in fsioctl.c, and then there is a few IOCTLs that, that, that get handled directly at that layer already. So um, there are some, I would say, more trivial operations, such as manipulating the close and execution flag on your file descriptor that works through IOCTL as well, not just through uh, FNCTL. And uh, then um, you can manipulate the async and buffered I.O. flags for your file. And there are a few trivial operations for, for regular files, like asking for the file size. Um, there is a whole set of operations that you can do on copy and write file systems for, um, for a reflink functionality, which means sharing of like the per page sharing of uh, pages be across files, uh, which is supported on copy and write file systems. And there are some operations on file systems, which is the, this is important uh, to be <laughs> precise about because that means it's not uh, this is not an operation on the file that you're calling it on, but the first thing that the implementation of this does is it looks up the superblock and then actually it works on the superblock. So that means this is actually an operation that, that um, works on the entire file system and not on the individual file that you're calling it on. And there is also a set of these. And then finally, if none of these is the command that was actually requested, then it'll fall back to the actual purpose of why IOCTL exists, and it, it'll call that very generic unlocked IOCTL hook. There is also a compatibility version of this one, which I omitted on the slides. Um, and then it's up to the file to implement what, how that uh, gets dispatched and what, how this is actually implemented. Um, so we looked at some implementations of that, and um, so some of, implement, some of the implementations unfortunately looked like this. So um, you can see here, this is a bit simplified. I, I know I'm not doing a return at the end, I noticed that. <laughs> um, so normally you have a giant switch statement in the middle and then it dispatches to some implementation of this. But then in some implementations you will also find uh, acquire resources step at the top and releasing resources at the end. This is often used for all kinds of locking or for uh, memory allocation that is needed for all of these implementations. But there is this little problem with it that turns out if you're calling this with, an, with a command number that is not actually recognized by this device driver, it'll, it'll do the locking step anyway. And it'll do the unlocking step as well. And you know, when I say locking and unlocking, it sounds very, oh, this is probably not that, wor not that bad. But reality is also, I found also some drivers where it's you know, a few hundred lines of graphics driver code, and I can't understand this. So it, it, this is not something that we want to make it very easy to dispatch to by accident. So um, that that was definitely a concern that we that we looked into. Now um, we thought about what what should be the criteria by which users should be permitted to um, control the dispatching of IOCTLs and landlock and. Then, of course, the LSM hook for this one, which is um, here at the, at the top, security file IOCTL, it takes the same arguments as the system call itself. So it takes a struct file, which is the file descriptor in user space, and then it takes the command, and then it takes a user space pointer that is not really useful for making a decision. Um, and then we thought about which of these properties can we use to, to um, control the policy. And then the natural one for us is, of course, the file path, because we already have pre-existing mechanisms, and this is the most un uncontroversial part of it. Then we thought about, should we be using, should we be looking at the file type, maybe? Um, turns out file types are not as granular as you would think. Um, so there are some 
There is some granularity that you can see from the struct file, but there are also a lot of anonymous files that um, are completely different things. And um, then there is a there is a, um, a mistake that was made in, in SE Linux in the past at some point where people thought, oh, we can use the structure of the command numbers because those get created with macros and um, there's a, a read and a, and a write bit on it, but turns out that doesn't actually describe whether that operation is for reading and for writing, but it describes whether the argument is being read or written. So that is also not something that you can use. And so in the end, um, to make that story short, this is actually like if you are interested in that longer discussion, you can read it up on the mailing list. It goes for months. Um, but uh, in the end of it, we basically came around and we said we're going to make a, a very simple implementation for now. We're going to um, restrict IOCTLs only on device files because this is where the largest variety of different uh, multiplexed commands can get executed. And um, we're going to make it restrictable by file path. So that means that users are still um, quite through the file paths, they can still substantially control what actual device files they might want to have exceptions for. And uh, finally, there's some very, very simple operations that we hand selected individually where we are sure that they are harmless and which we are going to allow anyway. And um, these ones are uh, fioclex fionclex, that's close on exec for the file descriptor. It doesn't actually touch the file, it only touches the file descriptor. Then fion bio fio async, those are the ones for controlling uh, buffered IO and asynchronous IO. And um, then we have a few that we own that actually would not work on, on device files and uh, we only permit them for error code consistency so that when you call it, you get back the right error code. This is one of the design goals that Landlock has that you still somewhat execute in a more natural environment and don't get uh, confronted with too many surprises. And uh, then finally, there is the set here at the bottom, which is the IOCTLs that actually work on the file systems. And we allow these ones because uh, it would anyway be possible to call these ones. You only have to invoke it on the parent directory or on, on any other file from the same file system. Um, yes, this is kind of the same slide again, uh, just in different words. Um, yeah, and yeah, so let's talk about the news that have happened in a, in a, uh, in a time since this presentation was last given. So I referred to it earlier already. Um, one of the surprises that came in March this year was that Landlock showed up in this um, in this attempt where people tried to, um, to to put a backdoor in XC, and they have uh, in XC manipulated the, uh, the the build tooling so that the check for whether Landlock is enabled or whether Landlock is, is is possible to use that that check was not working anymore, and it would always say it's not um, it's not enabled and it wouldn't build with Landlock support. Um, so I'm just mentioning this on the side. I think it validates a little bit that there, we are getting in the way of uh, nefarious people here. And I'm very happy about that. <laughs> yeah. um, then another thing that happened was uh, uh, last month, there was a, we had a bug actually that was a, a security bug discovered by Jan Horn. And I'm very thankful for that. And we encourage that people report bugs to us. That's why I'm mentioning it here. Um, the bug was about um, a confusion of different LSM hooks where we did not implement one of the LSM hooks properly, which we should have implemented. It'll get fixed. It is already fixed now, and we're going to hopefully add a more comprehensive fix from Jan uh, in the next months or for the next Linux release, hopefully, um, which is going to make that situation less likely that it happens to someone else. Um, the the next slide that I have, I have to be careful because people have misunderstood the slide a little bit in the past. Um, it mentions the name IOCTL. It is not directly related to that IOCTL feature I talked about earlier. So, um, and that is, uh, while I was looking at these, this IOCTL support, I realized there is another problem that Landlock has with IOCTL, and that is there is a 
I common IOCTL that exists on terminal devices and it's it's called TOXD and you can use it to add um, characters to the input buffer of the terminal device, which means you emulate a key press. So if you if you think about what that means for when you run multiple programs at different levels of privileges on the same terminal, it's actually a problem because and it is particularly a problem for landlock because if you have a little landlock tool down here and it has restricted privileges and it can add, it can emulate key presses. That means that it only has add a few key presses to the terminal, exit itself, and when the surrounding shell takes over the uh, uh, control again, it'll read these key presses and start interpreting them. This was this technique was used in a long list of uh, vulnerabilities for all kinds of sandboxing tools in the past. It's, um, there is also related IOCTL called TOG Linux that made the same thing possible on the text console, on the textual um, terminals. And um, these ones, luckily, they got fixed recently. So um, it got fixed in, in Linux 6.2 by, by Case Cook and uh, in, in, in 6.7 by Hanno Böck. And uh, the, the fix is essentially that you now need Capsus admin in order to use these features. And they have luckily not been used enough to, uh, to, uh, so that we, we, we were able to disable this. And as you can see here on the right hand side, this is a screenshot from a CVE search engine. And um, you can see the red parts here. People are already mentioning that if these, if these IOCTLs don't work anymore, and you can't use the exploit. So it, this actually works as well. Yeah. But this, these two slides about IOCTLs are not something that the Landlock IOCTL support has really, is really um, uh, interfering with. So it, there is not that much relation with it because in Landlock, the access rights get enforced at the time of opening a file, but the terminal file is good as you're inheriting you from your parent, right? So they are already open and um, that these policies don't apply to them. Um, now for the upcoming features. So we have uh, two features coming up uh, from Tahera Fahimi, who's also sitting in the room here. Uh, and um, it's about IPC restrictions. So um, one is uh, connecting to abstract Unix sockets. An abstract Unix socket is a, um, is a Unix domain socket that is uh, not identified by an address that is a socket file on the file system, but it's identified by an abstract uh, name, which is a flat kernel global namespace of um, available Unix domain sockets. And that is a, a Linux extension to that, to that system. And uh, so for these ones, we want to, we want to restrict that you can't um, that you can't connect across different processes under different landlock policies, which we call landlock domains, and there is a nesting of these policies. So um, it it should only work in one direction. So only from the processes that uh, uh, you know that that you can't control processes that are, have higher privileges than you have. Um, so this is, is going to be possible to restrict in the future. Same thing goes for signals. You also don't want to be able to signal a process that has higher oh that has higher privileges than you have. Um, that's also done by Tahera. Uh, then we have uh, networking features that are coming up. So I showed this picture before. At the moment, we already support bind and connect. Uh, as you can imagine, this picture here is, a, is the TCP schema, how you would do things. But that doesn't necessarily apply for other networking protocols. So it doesn't apply for UDP. So we can restrict bind and connect. but. Uh, at the same time, that same process then would be able to use UDP or would be able to use Bluetooth or you name it. You know, there's a whole list of different networking protocols that are mostly not used by many applications. So uh, the way out is, of course, that we restrict the, um, the use of, of the socket system call. Uh, the socket system call is also the one where you have to specify what protocol you're going to use. Um, that patch is currently in review, uh, done by, by Mikhail Ivanov. Uh, we have another one um, for listen. So as it turns out, what I showed earlier is when you when you walk down here on the server side that that uh, state transition, 
Turns out you can also open a listening socket without doing a bind first. And if you do that, you will get an ephemeral port, the same as what you would do when you do it as a client. And uh, so it's still possible to open a listening server. And, and uh, for that reason, we're also going to uh, restrict the, the listen operation in the future. And that patch is also currently in review by Mikhail Ivanov. And um, there is another one that is not in review yet, which is also quite, that was a bit of a surprise. This is also a Linux extension to the BSD socket API. It is actually possible to um, walk back in that state transition to an earlier state and then you, to reuse an existing socket. And that is done by calling connect with AF unspec. So uh, when you do that with, it, with one of the protocol ports, uh, with one of the sockets that use one of the protocols that support that, then it'll put, put the socket back into a state where you can use it for a new connection or for, for a new listening server. And that is, of course, for us, potentially a problem if, if you imagine the use case where you're running a network server and then someone breaks into that server and they're probably using a client connection to get into it. So they have a socket lying around. And if they were able to reuse that socket to disassociate it and to establish new connections, that is something that we don't want. So um, that's also something that is likely to, um, to, to be done soon. Yeah, and um, with that, uh, I think the presentation is at the end and I'm gonna take questions. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it says uh, disassociate. Um, I yeah, that's I'm I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. This uh, it says disassociate um, this um, this box here, and it that's the the operation that you would do to disassociate is to call connect with AF unspec. The man page actually actually explains it in the description section very much at the at the top. <laughs> Yes. Um, thanks a lot for the talk. I was interested in Landlock. Now I know a lot more about it. Um, I did some searching um, on the API level. I saw that there's already a Rust wrapper. Yep. So now the question is, um, with all those additional features that you're talking about, I'm sorry, how simple to use can you make the API? Because when what I saw on the slides, the C API, just to go home the point again that C is a terrible language for the security policy. Yeah. Um, how simple can we make the API so that people who are not interested in security policies can actually just a few simple statements, tooling, does the rest, and you get the policy that is reasonable for your program? Yes, that's a great question. So the, the question is, um, how, how simple can we make the API when we, ha when we use landlock wrapper libraries? Uh, and we have existing landlock wrapper libraries in, in, in Rust and in Go, which are written by, by Mikhail and by me. And uh, there, are, there are other ones in Haskell and in Perl, I believe, in Python. I'm not 100% sure about these because they're done by other people as well. Um, I'm going to talk about the Go version because I know that one better. <laughs> so um, the, I unfortunately don't have a slide on it, but uh, the, the invocation in Go is much simpler than in C. So the, the way you would use it is to, you say landlock dot version 5 dot best effort dot restrict and then you say read only path such and such as an argument and then read only path such and such as an argument and read write path such and such as an argument so if you create overall if you have two or three paths that you want to um, that you want to permit in your policy um, that entire call does not take more than a few lines it's basically an one function call with a bunch of things in front um, there are other APIs where this is simpler. Um, people, people don't like to, to hear it here, I guess. Like OpenBSD has an a similar API for it, which is called Pledge, that is only a simple, a single C call. Um, we can't make the API quite as simple as that because we have more uh, backwards compatibility issues that we're looking after. We have stricter uh, guarantees for that. So um, it is definitely necessary that you need to spell out as a caller at what level you, you want to use this, uh, the landlock API and what 
and which really means that you are spelling out uh, what operations you're going to restrict because if we weren't spelling it out, then in a future kernel version, um, you, it would start restricting more, right? And then it would break your backwards compatibility guarantee. And uh, so because we don't want that, it has by, necess by necessity, it has to be a little bit more complicated. Um, yeah, but these libraries, they can solve that best effort mode problem for you, right? They can do the downgrade to uh, older kernel versions. Um, in C, we currently don't have a support library that does that. Maybe we're going to create one at some point, uh, but with, it's also a little bit because we try to keep the C API as simple as possible and uh, force ourselves to make it uh, <laughs> easy enough to use also at, when, you, when you're using the bare syscalls. Yes? Is there any provision to override the policy defined by the Okay, the question is uh, whether there is a provision to override the policy that the de developer uh, did not intend the... No, there is no, no way to do that. Um, unless, of course, the developer puts a flag into their program that, that lets you do it, right? Um, yes. Um, so the question is whether the uh, whether we are maintaining a state in the policies. Um, I hope I understand this question right. We no, there is no state maintained once you once you establish the policy. The policy stays as it is. Um, okay, so the question is about whether the policies are still in place when, when, the, when the task has been killed. So the, the policies that you, that you establish, they only apply to your own program. So they only apply, this does not apply globally, no. It, this, is, this is different to, to SE Linux and AppArm and that respect that um, this is, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not top down where, where it's from the outside controlled what the policy is, but it's bottom up. It's the programs themselves that realize, oh, I may be doing something that is potentially dangerous, maybe using a bit too many dangerous libraries here. So um, I rather put another sandboxing layer around it for safety and uh, and then when they enforce that policy, the policy applies to their own process, it applies to their child processes, but uh, all the processes around that are, are not affected at all, unless you pass around the file descriptors in crazy ways, but it's unusual. Yeah. This is, by the way, also a reason why um, enabling landlock is, should be very lightweight for distributors to do, because the processes that don't use landlock, they're not going to have a policy, and then the only thing that the landlock LSM does is returns very quickly. So is there a plan to add something like this system wide? Like a uh, application which is privileged can do all the policy setting and can be read afterwards. It can control the, still the policies will be intact for uh, unsupervised applications uh, to uh, use. You can. You can use it for, for system-wide things as well, if you want, right? Um, so, uh, for, for example, if you are um, the developer of systemd, you could add landlock to, to systemd, and then it, it would still work for the services, right? You can still use it to build sandboxing tools, and as, and as, and as long as you're it's basically aligned with the, with the Unix process tree of parent and child processes, and when you enforce your policies at a high enough level, it applies to everything that is below, and that way you can still use it for more wide-ranging policies. Yes? Uh, can a library introduce exceptions to a landlock policy? That's a great question. So the question is, can a library introduce exceptions to a landlock policy? 
We don't currently have a mechanism for that. That's actually, you're, you're hitting a weak point with this question because um, that uh, the interaction with shared libraries is, is, is tricky, right? If, uh, if you load a shared library and it gets deployed separately from the actual application, and if the shared library changes what it does, it becomes harder to say what the, what the policy is. And uh, there is currently no, no mechanism uh, for that. Uh, I know there are people around here who have said that they're potentially uh, going to, to work on this. Um, but yeah, so far there is there is no no real mechanism for it. You have to um, come up with something yourself for now. Yeah. Yes. I think it's potentially unsafe uh, to allow exception because if 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 single library gets compromised in any way. The whole, the whole idea gone, is gone. Um, yes, so the, the remark was that it's potentially unsafe to permit exceptions for libraries. It's, it, is, it is potentially unsafe. It is, it is, a, it is a difficult question to, um, to figure out. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes? But I think the question also goes the other way around, which is you may want to shield a, a library to have some kind of context, like transform context, where when you go into a library, the library should be able to say temporarily, I want to restrict what I'm doing at a library that I only exist in this, in this file. So in some sense, be able to stack a, a temporary library context on top of your policy and then unstack it, mm -hmm. knowing that it's a, and, and that's also not possible. So it's, it's more a problem of generic composability uh, of the context. Yes, um, so, so the remark was that uh, the libraries sh could potentially have a, a policy that only applies to the library in the library context and within the process uh, that, the, that there is a part of the policy that only applies to the library. This is in practice difficult to do because the security boundaries that exist within the process are even more unconstrained, right? Like a library can very easily modify the memory of, of other pages in, in, in the same process. And then uh, it can very easily uh, influence what is happening elsewhere. So within the same process, we only apply one giant policy. And I don't currently see a good way to, to, to make that possible, that, that you can have multiple policies within the same uh, shared user space memory. Okay, no more questions? All right, thank you very much.